Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adrian Untermeyer, and I would like to officially welcome you to this podcast taping brought to you by the Historical Society of the New York Courts. And we are actually sitting somewhere very special today. We are sitting in a New York court, um, that being 60 Center Street, the New York County Courthouse. No, this is not a Zoom background. We are really here <laughs> in the fabled jury assembly room. Uh, my name is Adrian Untermeyer, and I am an attorney and a member of the New York Preservation Archive Project's Board of Directors, and I'm joined by an esteemed panel here, including one other New York Preservation Archive Project member, namely its executive director, Brad Vogel, who is also an attorney, and he is also a uh, preservation advocate and activist all across the city of New York, and notably, he is the captain of a group called the Gowanus Dredgers, which explores the Gowanus Canal. So we have a very wide-ranging um, panelist in Brad Vogel. Brad, welcome. Please tell us where you are. Yes. No, this is Brad Vogel, and I am the executive director of the New York Preservation Archive Project. Uh, also a member of the group Friends of George McEnany, uh, very fittingly for today's podcast. But I'm so glad to be here. And I'm also an attorney, uh, which gives sort of special resonance for me. And I was, I was not actually a litigator when I was an active attorney. So it's interesting for me to be sitting here behind the bar <laughs> uh, in a courtroom uh, here at 60 Center Street on Foley Square. Uh, and I can hear right now a blue jay out the window in the little back courtyard here that faces the back of 40 Center Street, which is the Thurgood Marshall Federal Courthouse. So right. Here. Right. The Thurgood Marshall United States Courthouse at 40 Foley Square, designed by Cass Gilbert, who also did the uh, Supreme Court of the United States. You may have heard of it. Um, but we're not alone here today. We also have our esteemed panelist, Lucy Levine. Um, Lucy is actually joining me from the other side of the jury assembly room. Um, and I should say it is the Norman Goodman jury assembly room, so named for the long time, I believe it was 45-year uh, county clerk here in New York County. Lucy, welcome. Lucy uh, founded Archive on, on Parade. It is a tour guide company of her own creation. She's worked with every group out there from the Historic Districts Council to the Municipal Arts Society um, to private functions and tours. And she's also a member of the Friends of George McEnany. Lucy, welcome. Please tell us where you are. Thank you so much, Adrian. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here with you. I am uh, also at the jury assembly room at 60 Center Street. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm here in the uh, more historic side in terms of the murals. And Lucy's over there on the modern side. Lucy, which murals do you see over there? If I look above me here, uh, I have a beautiful rendering of the Port of New York. If I look to my right, um, I have a wonderful rendering of the uh, Woolworth building. And if I look to my left, I can see Atlas uh, holding up the world in front of Rockefeller Center, and of course, uh, the beautiful and fabled New York Public Library, my favorite building in New York, with which, <laughs> I, sh with which I share my birthday. <laughs> there you go. It's always good to share a birthday with an old building. Um, we, we really have a lot of people to thank for being here in the New York County Courthouse today to discuss George McEnany. Um, we're here thanks to the Historical Society of the New York Courts, which is dedicated to doing just that, um, preserving the history of, of New York's courts all across the state, including here in New York County. Um, special thanks also go out to the New York County Clerk, um, Judge Milton Tingling, um, who I believe is the first jurist in New York history to ever assume a county clerk position afterwards. And he's also the first African-American uh, county clerk here in New York County. So he's made some history in his own right. Um, and we're also here thanks to John Werner, um, who worked very closely with uh, with Norman Goodman before his retirement, um, but John served as the chief clerk of the civil branch here at 60 Center Street for many years with great distinction. And of course, um, Justice Andrea Maisley and her entire team um, who gratefully and graciously lent us uh, the courtroom where Brad is sitting today on this Friday afternoon. So it may say in God we trust, but in Maisley we trust as well. Thank you, Judge, um, for allowing us to be here today. Um, you know, we're here, in this place together um, for a very particular reason. And the reason is because we are discussing 
George Francis McEnany within the context of the New York County courts. And we're here to discuss this distinguished gentleman right here uh, by the name of George F. McEnany. Now, he, he's a distinguished looking guy, um, but we may be wondering um, why on earth we're here on a legal podcast discussing George McEnany, who was, of course, a civic leader um, who served in many, many roles here in New York City, New York State, and indeed nationally, um, among other things. He, uh, he helped lobby for the original Penn Station, um, that Beaux-Arts structure that was in Midtown Manhattan, um, working under counsel to the Pennsylvania Railroad, although McEnany was not an attorney himself. He was legally trained, but he was um, reportedly too fearful to ever take the bar exam. Um, he did many other things with his life as well. Um, McEnany went on to uh, be in the board of estimate of the city of New York. Um, he went on to plan all sorts of things, um, such as the widening of the avenues, the expansion of the subway system throughout New York, and all that. But McEnany also was a bit of a civic center aficionado. And that's really what brings us here today um, to 60 Center Street, to Foley Square. Um, it's the first sort of entree to George McEnany as this civic center guy, um, partially responsible in many ways for the civic center we have today. Um, so. I want our discussion here today um, to take sort of three parts. I think, first of all, we've got to get the Civic Center stuff out of the way. You know, what is McEnany's direct link um, to the Civic Center, to Foley Square, to legal life here in New York? Um, but we also have to broaden the lens a little bit because McEnany really had an incalculable impact on the law in other respects as well. He was known as the, quote, godfather of zoning in this country. And we're going to get into that a little bit as well. Um, he also was instrumental in early historic preservation efforts. And um, he really helped spread the gospel of historic preservation through institutions across the United States, including the National Trust for Historic Preservation, of which he was a part. Um, so that's a pretty big biography. But I think I wanted to start with Lucy. Um, who the heck was George McEnany and why should we care? That's a great question. Um, he's certainly an unsung hero of the civic history of our city. Um, sometimes he's held up as a counterpoint to Robert Moses. So when it comes to shaping our city, both of those men uh, had an incalculable role in the shaping of this place, this city that we know, and in particular, Foley Square, of course, when it comes to George McEnany, which is why we're here. But George McEnany began as a good government reformer. Actually, he began as a newspaper reporter, but then got into good government reform. And eventually, uh, as you mentioned, Adrian, he will be responsible for the expansion of the subways, for the creation of Foley Square, for the saving of Castle Clinton, and for a number of other civic projects. But when it comes to his role at Foley Square, this was really... Um, a vision that he tried to realize when it came to a civic center. And I hope as this podcast goes on, we'll talk about how and why that was actually connected to his role when it came to the father of zoning in this country and to the expansion of the subway and even to the expansion of the streets, that everything that he tried to create in the city of New York, he tried to do uh, within the context of a vision for the city of greater New York. I always think of him as a greater New Yorker, not just a New Yorker, but really a mover and shaker when it came to the shaping of this thing, this consolidated city uh, that we think of when we think of greater New York. Right, right. I, and, and that is quite the resume um, for a guy from Jersey. <laughs> he was born in the, the scrappy little town of Greenville, New Jersey. It's actually a neighborhood um, of Jersey City, I believe. And he made his way over um, to New York County. And, you know, he was a bit of a dandy visually. Um, Brad, just tell us about the look of George McEnany. What, you know, you started off a talk with me once about beard versus no beard McEnany, but, but he was a bit of a striking figure, which helped him attract all of this attention. Um, I am 100% I am, I am team pro beard. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brad, as a dapper fellow yourself, um, tell us a little bit about the figure that McEnany cut and the circles that he ran in. Sure, sure. You know, and McEnany is a very interesting character because in some ways he's he sort of rises up into social prominence through various channels. And one of those was by association with a gentleman named Jacoby. 
who was really one of the foremost sort of public health advocates um, of his day. And it was by allying himself with people like Jacoby and other civic reformers, uh, as Lucy was mentioning, this sort of like civil service reform and this vision of a broader New York City wide, um, greater New York vision for the city and a lot of fusion party politics. So essentially efforts um, to fight Tammany Hall and its stranglehold on politics. Um, he ended up with, as you often do in politics, some strange bedfellows now and then, but you know, he ends up as the borough president of Manhattan um, just over a decade after the consolidation of the five boroughs in 1898. So you have this relatively new vehicle that you're driving, so to speak. And George McEnany is someone who says, I, you know, I think there's a better way to drive this. Um, and he comes in in that way. And, you know, yes, he cuts a very dapper figure. And I think it's interesting because you see in that, that first image you put up, Adrian, I think speaks volumes. Here you have this relatively young man with a beard and a top hat um, surrounded by oftentimes much older men in positions of civic power. So you can literally see that there is someone with new ideas coming in. And um, McEnany is always surprises me because the man wore so many hats, not just top hats, um, <laughs> but other hats too. And the many roles that Lucy laid out are just the beginning. The man worked for the New York Times. He worked for, he was a uh, part of the 1939 World's Fair. Um, he they almost single-handedly saved Federal Hall that we now still have at the head of uh, Broad and Wall. Um, that's sort of the place where Washington was inaugurated and, and McEnany announced the saving of that building from destruction on the 150th anniversary of uh, Washington's birth. So, you know, significant interests and involvements uh, by this man, but he really did throughout his time have this unique ability to garner trust and build coalitions. And it's that ever churning ability across really 50 years of civic life that uh, don't seem to make him a wealthy man per se. They make him a central man, someone who can be relied upon, someone who is sort of always there helping to get people to do the right thing. Um, and he really shifts, I think, and, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but he shifts a bit from being someone who's maybe more in the Moses mold early on, um, even with Foley Square. You know, Foley Square is a very interesting piece of ground. It's, um, it's the remnants of Colette Pond in some ways. Um, it is the northernmost edge of the old African burial ground from the 1700s. Uh, it is, you know, part of Lenape Hoking and the, the Lenape village of Warepost that was nearby. So there's, there are many, many, many layers here. Um, and then as immigrants come into America, increasingly there are what, you know, at the time were looked at as tenement slums. Uh, and so that actually goes away as this civic center during the sort of city beautiful movement is created around the square. Brad, you know, you painted such a vivid picture of old New York. Um, and of course, you see those of you who are viewing um, the video version of this, you can see that picture of old New York behind me right now. Um, but Lucy, you know, McEnany's foray into the law um, really didn't start with uh, with a litigation per se. It was more of a real estate transaction. And we're speaking, of course, of what I alluded to earlier, that first deal that he cut involving Pennsylvania Station in Midtown Manhattan. Now, I represent New Jersey Transit in my day job, and I don't want to disparage Penn Station too much, but Lucy, take us back um, to the Penn Station of 1910 and tell us a little bit about what McEnany did in order to make that happen. Ah, uh, the original Penn Station of myth and fame. <laughs> McKim, Mead, and White. Um, Obviously, the old Penn Station has many connotations in the history and, of course, the preservation history of the city of New York. It is often held up as the monument that gave us the 1965 preservation law because its loss was that dramatic for the city. But McEnany, who becomes this 
mover and shaker, this really uh, momentous and meaningful man in the in the preservation fight is there at the beginning because he really makes the creation of Penn Station possible. And, and to do that, he is brokering, his, his role in the law is, as you say, not um, one having to do with litigation, but really having uh, to do with brokering stakeholders in the city as to where is this train shed going to go? How is the Pennsylvania Railroad going essentially to assert itself into the city? And when he does this in 1910, uh, he's doing it as borough president of Manhattan, right? He's already got a great deal of power in the city because the borough presidency at that time, when he assumes the borough presidency in 1909, um, and he does so on the fusion ticket, uh, he does so with a lot of power. And the fact that he does so on the fusion ticket is meaningful because that was who he really was. He was a person who was able to fuse the interests of a number of constituencies uh, within the city. And we'll see him do this with zoning. We'll see him do it with the subway. And so his goal is how to bring together a group of constituencies to make it possible for the Pennsylvania Railroad essentially to create its presence. Uh, in the city of New York and what becomes this iconic gateway, right? The idea that one enters the city like a god. And that really is in, in many ways, thanks to George Mackinac. It is. And, you know, you alluded to his period as borough president. And McEnany also was involved with that project really in the early stages, too, under the tutelage of E.M. Shepard, Council to the Pennsylvania Railroad, um, doing land acquisition and this and that. But, Brad, as you always remind us, um, it's not like there wasn't a neighborhood there in Midtown before, which brings us to sort of questions of eminent domain and, and who the city belongs to and private interests. Um, you know, privatizing public lands. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about what that process was on this very early legal foray of McEnany's. Sure, yes. So the, the key thing to remember is that, you know, as much as we hearken back to Penn Station as this great example of architecture and this very significant resounding loss in sort of our sense of preservation and the culture of the city, it was located on a neighborhood called the Tenderloin, um, at the time, which, you know, was certainly renowned in some ways for its vice, but was also a place inhabited largely by minorities and including a significant African-American population. So as is so often the case in New York, um, you know, real estate dynamism does have impacts on people's lives. And so, again, when I said earlier that earlier in his career, McEnany was a bit more like what we might expect from Robert Moses you know, there was displacement uh, when Penn Station was built. Uh, and that actually had ramifications on where African-Americans then ended up post tenderloin um, within the city. But that's, you know, that's another story for another day that we could go on for <laughs> at length. But, you know, it's, it's important to, to think about how different one domino moves and another domino is impacted. And you can actually take that back to Foley Square again, because the one of the ways that I first learned about his impact on Foley Square and the Civic Center that's emerged here was learning about McEnany's involvement with the preservation of New York City Hall, which was built as, you know, 1803 to 1812. It's a very old, one of the oldest continuously in use city halls in the, in the country. Um, and in a city like New York, there are all kinds of forces and things over these 200 years that have been you know, clawing at City Hall and thinking, well, what if, we, what if we could do something better? What if we could rearrange this? There are so many minds and forces that, that act on any given plot of land in the city, especially one that's this far downtown. Well, the thing was, McEnany was working, and I believe this was right around the time he was borough president on restoring City Hall, and there was talk of building a very large courthouse structure immediately to the north of City Hall, where the Tweed Courthouse is today, or what we know as the Tweed Courthouse, um, because that was overcrowded. And McEnany was definitely involved in making sure that that didn't happen and really pushed for that replacement structure or sort of annex structure to be further north. So where is further north from there? Oh, Foley Square. So 
you know, in terms of preservation, he was working to preserve City Hall, which by that point was quite decrepit. Um, and that was, you know, building off of work of Andrew Haswell Green and some others previously in 1890s. But um, then also saving the Tweed Courthouse, which has, again, its own long <laughs> separate story that one can go and, and dig and find out about. Uh, but, but again, it's the crucial thing that in saving those two buildings, you displace whatever is new off into some place that is further north. And so we arrive at Foley Square. That's correct. We, we really do arrive at Foley Square. And it's interesting, too, that City Hall, of course, is a locus of the law as well. It's literally where the laws are made and the seat of government resides in so many respects here in uh, New York County. Um, but, but Lucy, you know, this, this look north from City Hall was going on against the backdrop of this Civic Center movement, which, you know, we, we do call it a movement and it was a bit of a, an evangelist affair. Um, why were people so into Civic Centers at this time? That's such a great question. There were two movements that were happening concurrently at that time. And one was the City Beautiful movement and the other was the Sanitary movement. The Sanitary movement actually begins uh, in London in the 1840s and has to do with what we were today in, in a lot of ways called urban renewal and slum clearance. And it was the notion that you could make dense population centers, namely cities, namely tenement districts, uh, namely working class districts, into sanitary spaces uh, that would keep people safe, that would keep them well uh, in the face of disease. But really, as Brad was mentioning, uh, it was a way of, in many ways, displacing the poor uh, and also the underserved. Uh, and at the same time, there was or came to be at the turn of the 20th century in the United States, first in Chicago and then in New York, something called the City Beautiful Movement, which was really pioneered uh, by architects, particularly Richard Morris Hunt in 1893, and then moves into the turn of the century. And it was the idea that grand civic architecture could uplift the populace, that beautiful buildings could literally teach uh, city dwellers, New Yorkers in particular, how to be part of a civilized society, literally a civic body, the body politic. And so you had these two competing ideas with Foley Square. So first, McEnany realizes, okay, we want to, in a way, quote unquote, preserve City Hall, but not only preserve it, but preserve the idea and indeed the ideal of City Hall, which is the idea of City Hall as a almost pristine monument within what's now called City Hall Park, even though historically that was not its reality. It had always been surrounded um, by a number of other structures because the land that we call City Hall Park uh, was originally the commons, right? And so we had almshouses, we had jails, we had, even we had gallows, you know, in, in what we now call City Hall Park, that it was not this, uh, sort of shining city on a hill civic space, that it was really a, a rancorous place in a lot of ways. And so there was the idea of saving that ideal, which was never the reality. Um, and so moving then, as you say, this courthouse north, which McEnany does. And when he does, he's also very interested, not only in the idea of the city beautiful and the uplifting grandeur of the courthouse, which we see today, but also he knows and hopes that if he's able to redevelop what we now call Foley Square with private development along with the, the public buildings, there will be a kind of sanit sanitary, quote unquote, experience, which is that he'll be able to tear down what had been a tenement district and make it into something that, that he might describe as more sanitary, more clean. But then again, you have this experience, this major experience, of displacement and where would and where did those people go? Right, and, and not to, you know, Brad, you don't have a white and black fluffy tail, but I am gonna make you the skunk at the garden party again because <laughs> as Lucy correctly points out, there was also an element of displacement here too. Wasn't this five points? Yes, this was some of the five points, uh, what were termed slums. Um, 
And, you know, this happens with McEnany again in the West Village with the extension of 7th Avenue that was sort of plowed through. And we can still see these sort of strange angles and backs of buildings on 7th Avenue today. And over 250 buildings were demolished. So again, early in his career, McEnany has this kind of bent as he's going about some of these grand civic plans. Um, the real turning point with him, though, where you start to see this sense that this man is going to become one of the co-founders of the National Trust for Historic Preservation is around, you know, when he's borough president, he's pushing to figure out what to do with these pesky preservationists who want to save St. John's Chapel, um, which was a chapel of Trinity Church, and the church was looking to get rid of it. It was quite old at that time. This is over on the west side. Um, near sort of where I think where the Holland Tunnel entrance is today, sort of the Barrick Street area. And McEnany, this is where things start to change because in response to these preservationist pressures, he instructs an, a group, a committee looking at this whole affair to say, what can we do to save the chapel and have the road go through and the subway underneath the road? So sort of let's, let's find a win-win-win if we can't. And so they actually come up with a plan that would have put the sidewalk, sort of the portico of the church would jut out into what was the sidewalk, but also allow the roadway to go through, thereby everybody wins. Well, he leaves office, 1918, end of World War I, the Spanish flu, all sorts of things happening. And amidst it all, St. John's goes down. So he attempts a preservation friendly and yet sort of civic expansion accommodating solution, but it does not work. Right, it doesn't work, but what, what does end up working is his initiative here on Foley Square. People do end up being displaced and we need to honor their memories, but there was also a transformation of that area. Um, Lucy alluded to the uh, the sanitary movement at the time. And of course the Tweed Courthouse um, up against City Hall was desperately overcrowded by that time. So in 1912, um, this this really starts to crystallize with the um, with the design competition for the building that we now know as 60 Center Street. And McEnany is pushing all of this from his various perches. At that time, McEnany is really holding a lot of different roles. Um, you know, you, you almost have to go to a list of all of his um, perches over the years to really understand the the depth and breadth of the man. But I always think to myself, does it even really matter what he was doing? Because essentially he was doing the same thing he always did, which was out there breaking bread with all sorts of different folks trying to make things happen. And what happened in this case was a grand civic center. Of course, it wasn't completed in one fell swoop. And we had to wait for elements such as the uh, the Lefkowitz building, um, the New York State office building that Al Smith laid the cornerstone for, um, which is now, of course, known as the uh, Manhattan Marriage Bureau. And uh, some of us on this call may have played a little hand um, in making sure that uh, didn't meet with the uh, the wrecking ball under Mayor de Blasio. And of course, there's also the um, the United States Federal Building marking the west of Foley Square, which, of course, is a, a, a modernist and international nationalist intervention. But here at 60 Center Street, we have this, um, this gorgeous, multi-sided courthouse. Of course, it's iconic, you know, the beginning of Law and Order, um, of course, the Godfather assassination scene at the end. I'm sitting here on the very bench, um, we're in Goodfellas, there was that, uh, that wonderful courtroom scene at the end. But it's really, um, it's really inspired by these great classical themes. Um, it's, it's intended to add a sense of grandeur and majesty um, to the everyday legal proceedings. And, and and McEnany had this hand in it. Uh, and so I'm sort of curious, after you know, all three of us having met in the rotunda of the building today, um, starting first with you, Lucy, what, what is the end result? Tell us about this building that we're in. How does it make you feel? This is a beautiful building. Uh, just the, the exterior, the interior, the muraling. I, you know, and I think that really comes out of the city beautiful and the idea that you know, this space is a space for the public and to um, to show what the public can be, what it can mean, you know. And I think that when when it comes to George McEnany and his role and his work, you know, I think he was really a planner in a lot of ways for the public. And I think that his role brokering the dual contracts and the the expansion of the subway really does show that very well. And I think that the 
the role of the subway here in Foley Square actually cannot be gainsaid. So I think that those two things go hand in hand. So for example, when I came here today, I got out of the subway under the municipal building and I walked up under the municipal building. And the reason that I tell you that is because the municipal building, when it opened in 1914, uh, was the first building in the city of New York to have a subway station built underneath it, built literally into the fabric of the building itself. Uh, and the reason that I mention that is because that station, while it's the first station that ever opened the city hall station uh, in the original plan for the IRT 1904, when it opens, again, when the municipal building opens in 1914, it's, it's a renewed statement of what the city is, of what greater New York is. And the idea that this place, that Foley Square, is so connected to the subway and that our, not only the municipal building, but literally our municipal government, our, our space of justice is specifically rendered on the subway itself, uh, means that it's a place for the people and that McEnany having a hand both in the creation of Foley Square and the expansion of the subway, I think cannot be game said because his goal uh, in creating Greater New York is to create a space and a place where people could take the subway to literally the city center, right? To Foley Square and conduct their business, conduct their legal proceedings, but then be able to take those same subways out of the city center and towards more dignified and gracious housing than the what he might have thought of as even slums, if we use that word. He may have thought of, of working class districts in that way, but didn't want people to have to live in that regard. And so his goal with the subway was not only to give people an opportunity to get to these civic centers, but also to get away from them and to get to dignified housing in the outer boroughs. And so the idea of these two things going hand in hand, I think is really meaningful uh, to think about. Yeah, and there's a wonderful old um, cartoon of McEnany from those days. And it's a picture of him with a saw hacking a building in half. And the caption of course is light, air, that's the rub. He was a major proponent of that light and air and bringing that um, to the huddled masses. That point about the subway is so correct. And, you know, if you go down into the subway facilities now, you can even see some of the old cover-up doors that would lead directly into the courthouses. And I haven't gotten a straight answer on which courthouse, whether it was the Cass Gilbert or this one that have access. But um, so for those of you playing at home, you may have to come down to Foley Square and submit your theories to us. But Brad, how did you feel coming into this building today? What was the end result of McEnany's efforts? You know, it was quite dignified, I must say. The, uh, the grand stairway and the lawgivers up in fresco on the dome of the rotunda it was very impressive. Um, and, you know, I think one thing that Foley Square effectively does, because if you look at where City Hall is located, it's in this sort of great cirque of taller buildings around this small, almost, almost crater lake like, if you will, um, with the small little cone in the middle of City Hall, but it's surrounded by these much larger buildings, many of which represented the interests of the press. You had major newspapers located all around City Hall and sort of commerce with things like the Woolworth Building. So those are sort of dominate the square on the south and the west. And then to the north and the east, you begin to have especially after McEnany's term as borough president, these civic structures rising. And so Foley Square in some ways to me seems as if it's an attempt by government to assert itself and build itself its own center, its own sort of functional place of the gathering of the powers that show the public that the government is there for them um, in a tangible way that in some ways offsets this sort of nagging sense that New York is a corporation. Um, ah. it goes way back to the Dutch times and this emphasis on commerce um, that really is kind of embodied in the, the ringing of City Hall Park by so many um, you know, private interests. 
Right, and that harkens back to, you know, one of the images behind me and, and you know, of course, thinking of the original purchase, quote unquote, of Manhattan with beads and shells and other worthless notions and trinkets is the consideration. Um, it, it's, it's a place rich and replete with history. And I think that um, we're all so touched by the fact that we're here and, and the fact that we're able to discuss McEnany's role um, along with the other collateral impacts, some good, some bad um, of that time. But McEnany's impact was certainly not limited to Foley Square alone as we've alluded to. And if you're curious to learn more about this, um, Brad, Lucy and I are all members of the Friends of George McEnany, which is a group designed to preserve the memory of that august individual. And our website um, can easily be Googled. If you just go and Google Friends of George McEnany, you can learn about the man's full history and the many roles um, that he's held in all of the lectures and tours and other events um, that we have going on. But McEnany, as I said earlier, was remembered as the godfather or the father or the grandfather, the quote varies, um, of zoning in this country. But I think suffice to say, we don't have that elevator shaft, equitable building style, darkened street thanks to that zoning resolution in New York that was so influential across the country and of course was tested again and again in the courts all over the country and and you know managed to persist and we have light and we have air and we have rational planning in many respects thanks to zoning um but of course, zoning is also a bit of a crutch. Um, if you were to ask Dr. Jeffrey Kressler, um, he would revert to his old quote, in New York, we don't plan, we zone. Um, but George McEnany thought we could do both. Um, Lucy, you know, the zoning resolution is kind of a college seminar, um, and we don't want to bore people too much, but it, it, it was a monumental piece of legislation, and I mean that in every sense of the word, puns included. Just tell us what the zoning resolution was and why people wanted it, and a little bit about what McEnany did to make it happen. Sure. Um, I love the zoning resolution. I love the 1960s. You love everything, don't you, Lucy? <laughs> I do. Yes, I do. Um, the 1916 zoning resolution is the first zoning resolution, not only in New York, but in the nation. And it really was a way of saving for the city its natural light and air. And so when we think of the New York skyline, the best way I think to, to describe the 1916 zoning resolution is to think of the classic New York skyline, which is that gorgeous and inspiring Art Deco skyline that gives us our wedding cakes. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you're not talking about 346 Broadway. <laughs> no, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> no, but if we think of that wedding cake silhouette, that is uh, what Eli Jacques Kahn, the great uh, Art Deco architect, called the New York style. And he said that that style came out of the 1916 zoning resolution because of the very restrictions it contained. And that he believed that good zoning and indeed good planning allowed for the creativity that brought what became the Art Deco skyline um, of New York City. And indeed it did. And, and so when we look at that Art Deco zoning envelope, that is literally a legal zoning envelope. You can look at the Chrysler building and say it's beautiful, but without the 1916 zoning resolution, that would not look the way that it does. It, that is mandated by law that as you go uh, up, as you build vertically a certain number of feet, you need to set back your next story uh, so that you have this space for light and air to move through the buildings. You had referenced, Adrian, the equitable building and, and the issue with that building when it opened in 1915, obviously before the 1916 zoning resolution, is that it didn't give us the experience of the setback and instead we have this terrible shadow right across Broadway. What McEnany does to get zoning, because for his goal, his goal is light and air, right? That's the rub I think is you. That's the you rub. <laughs> you know, his goal is very egalitarian, right? It's, it's light and air for the masses, but he's able to move a number of constituencies who are not necessarily interested in, you know, uplifting the masses at all. And those people are the great robber barons of Fifth Avenue. And they become at the turn of the century very upset because suddenly there's a number of buildings along Fifth Avenue north of like 35th Street that are loft buildings, that are um, manufacturing buildings, particularly garment factories. Um, and this also has to do with a distaste for the working classes, a distaste for immigrants. And in particular, because of the garment factories and the, the role of who was working in garment factories, it really has to do with the distaste for Italians and for Jews, which is that 
the robber barons of Fifth Avenue did not want um, the hoi polloi, if you want. They didn't want the working classes, and in particular, people who were working in garment factories to be encroaching, making their way up Fifth Avenue. And so you had that very powerful group of people in New York City who, who McEnany was really able to appeal to and say, listen, if we have zoning, you know, it's a way to say there's going to be uh, manufacturing zones and there are going to be residential zones. And so he's able actually to pull this sleight of hand where he's really working for light and air, you know, for the masses, but to say to the millionaires, you know, today's billionaires row along 57th street, don't worry, I have your back. I'm going to do something you'll love. And he does, and he does. And, you know, and we get the zoning for what becomes the garment district. So, you know, the way that we think of our city and, and where, we work and where we live and where we play really comes out of the restrictions of this zoning code, but gives us in so many ways, the city that we're so proud to have, that gorgeous skyline comes out of that zoning code. But so too do our manufacturing centers, so too do our residential neighborhoods, that when it comes to the building of the city, you know, it really is McEnany's hand all over the island and, and throughout the outer boroughs. Right, and, and not a heavy hand. You know, it's putting these unseen legal forces and political forces and social forces sort of in place and spinning them out like uh, little whirling dervishes, and then they take on a bit of a life of their own. Um, you know, Brad, you're a man who writes poems about buildings. Um, you most memorably, uh, memorably delivered an ode to Grand Central Terminal at an event that we helped organize together. Um, give us an ode um, to the zoning resolution in, in your eye. Hmm, I would say something along the lines of ziggurats, how we need the light, air, McEnany, all his children here and there. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'm not sure what form of poem that is. But <laughs> and, you know, cigarettes, of course, being that form, um, almost the, the sawtooth form, the yeah. terracing, exactly, that Lucy was speaking about um, with respect to the Chrysler building, and you see it on the Empire State Building, and, and so many others. It's, it's a signature pattern. Um, but, you know, McEnany kind of hatched a lot of other patterns as well um, throughout the city. You know, Lucy alluded to the pattern of subway expansion, how the the uh, the lines progressed out into the boroughs and little neighborhoods um, formed around them and the rest is history. But he also sort of spearheaded um, the pattern of the almost self-driven preservation campaign. You know, he almost single-handedly spearheaded these World's Fair efforts when they were not that popular in New York. And, um, you know, Brad and I have speculated over the years in other talks that maybe some of these efforts were just excuses to try and save um, some of his favorite buildings in New York that had lost a rationale. And I'm looking at you, Federal Hall um, downtown, <laughs> which, of course, is another um, beloved legal landmark and of course not the building but the site of where George Washington took that first oath of office so a very significant site in legal history but Brad you know McEnany also was involved with the National Trust for Historic Preservation and we were fortunate enough to have Paul Edmondson the head of the National Trust at uh, the New York Preservation Archive Project's Bard Breakfast last year tell us a little bit about what the National Trust is today and and how McEnany helped bring us that group that really impacts the law through its lobbying and advocacy efforts across the nation. Right. So the, the National Trust is a federally chartered institution, but it is chiefly known today as a nationwide advocate for historic places and sort of treasures of American history in the built environment, chiefly. Um, but the National Trust really grew out of a council that McEnany helped found in the wake of a very crucial fight, actually a series of, of fights in lower Manhattan. And this was in sort of the, across most of the 1940s. First, it was this great effort to stop a huge bridge that uh, Robert Moses had proposed that would have run from the battery from the tip of Manhattan all the way across, stopping at Governor's Island and making its way over to Brooklyn. Later, as we today, of course, know that becomes a tunnel, but that would not have been a tunnel, but for the advocacy of George McEnany, people like Albert Bard, uh, uh, Cup Burlingame, Burlingame um, CC, as he was known to many at the time, um, and even folks like Eleanor Roosevelt stepping in and doing their part where they could. Um, and of course, in the end, it was really the War Department 
that uh, that it said, no, we can't do that, at least theoretically, because it would have impacted vessel traffic and movement. Um, right. The theory was that the bridge would come down and, and block access to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, notwithstanding the fact that there are two bridges already <laughs> there in the way. But we, we digress, don't we, Brad? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. But the crucial thing is that McEnany, once again, and at this point, he's considerably older than the, the other sort of windows that we've been looking at him in along the way here. Um, but he, you know, he fights the bridge. And then there's a second fight where they are the same group and more come in and fight his Moses furious over the loss of his bridge um, and the changing of it to a tunnel um, goes after in, in his spite goes after Castle Clinton. Now Castle Clinton, of course, is this 1808, 1811, very early um, stone structure that at the time it was built was built um, as sort of a coastal defense and was put up because the, the threat of a British invasion of the US was still very much a real threat at the time. The nation was still very young. Um, and it was actually built on, the, at the time, an island that you had to take a causeway from Manhattan out to. And of course, over several centuries, that filled in with debris. And suddenly you had this grand park, the battery there, um, surrounding it entirely. But uh, Moses, at, at, and also crucially, the Castle Clinton has filled many different roles over time. You know, originally it was a fort, then it was a pleasure garden and concert venue. And then it became an immigrant station, sort of the precursor to um, the, the famous island that we all know, Ellis Island, out in the harbor. So it had all these lives. And then in, it becomes late in the Victorian era, an aquarium for the city. And so it is this old, ancient ring of stone inside of a larger structure um, that's a very popular attraction for people. But... Um, by the time this whole fight is going down in the late 1930s into the 40s, most of the aquarium gets stripped away and you're seeing just these remnant walls. But Moses is trying to restrict access so that people can't see. And there's all these stories of sending in reporters to do sort of behind the scenes looks and flyovers to try to ascertain that, in fact, these ancient hallowed walls of Castle Clinton are still there and worth fighting for. So Moses tries to tear it down, saying that it has to go down for the off- off, or actually the on-ramps, I guess, into the tunnel to work out. And there's this famous hearing where George McEnany is up there as this sort of august, much more senior civic figure at the time, arguing against tearing it down. And Moses is uh, on the other side of things. And he, he starts to level just these very colorful epithets. At Are you talking about the exhumed mummy and the, <laughs> the extinct volcano is another one. The extinct volcano. <laughs> so Robert Moses is, is really tearing into him. Um, but in the end, through thick and thin and persistence across a decade, uh, ultimately, they do win the fight. And in 1949, 1950, um, it becomes clear that the federal government is going to recognize this site um, as a national monument. There's going to be official recognition. McEnany gives a speech in October, I think, of 1950 that sort of recounts this long slog of a fight. But it's during that fight, crucially, that in sort of recognizing the need to protect places like this as modernity continues to move in and as the road and the interstate and the highway begins to really dominate American life, people realize that something has to exist as a counterforce or we are going to lose everything. And so in that process, McEnany helps found a council, which then becomes part of the founding of the National Trust. And so there's this, this man who we could say early in his career was responsible for displacement and destruction of what were historic neighborhoods, has moved to this pivot point of St. John's Chapel, you know, becomes part of the Regional Plan Association and the 1916 Zoning Code, where there's like this sense that we, there are some things that must be held in, inviolate against all these forces of the city and of, of greed. 
and then gets to a point where he's launching the National Trust, which becomes a force for preservation of neighborhoods and landmarks and buildings across the country for the rest of American history. So it's a really interesting transformation. And there are, you know, sort of these interesting political legal steps that McEnany is involved in at every point along the way. Right. It was almost a stone thrown in a pond or, you know, really a stone thrown into New York Harbor. And the ripples were, were felt um, again and again and again, um, as he did, you know, to coin a phrase, as has been written about, wrestle with Moses, wrestle with the great power broker. And, you know, it sort of laid the, the cornerstone in many ways for all these other um, confrontations with Moses that happened over the, um, the pursuing, the, the ensuing decades, um, where, where folks really gained that level of confidence to say, well, you know, if you were to look at the United States Constitution, nowhere does it say that there's a dictatorial force who can sort of single-handedly uh, make laws, make land, in many cases, create entities um, almost single-handedly, blackmail politicians, leverage um, the folks who are in the contractor community. I mean, it was it was very um, it was very hard to stand up to Moses. But once the cracks in the dam started to form, you saw initiatives such as um, what happened at Tavern on the Green. That level of opposition to Moses um, destroying a beloved community institution. Um, of course, we all are familiar with Jane Jacobs' advocacy in the Lower Manhattan Expressway. All these little um, land use battles that really culminated in a couple of key pieces of legislation. McEnany died, I believe, in the 1950s, and so he never saw a chance to see them, but he was very much a part of this linear um, march. And I'm speaking, you know, specifically of, of NEPA at the federal level, you know, the reason why we have federal review of all of these environmental decisions. And of course, the New York City Landmarks Law um, of 1965, which really came full circle from Pennsylvania Station. Um, Lucy, what is the landmarks law and, and how does it come from Penn Station? Sure. So the 1965 landmarks law gives the Landmarks Preservation Commission in New York City the power to rule on not only the appropriateness of a structure under the zoning code, but also on whether or not a structure is meritorious for landmarking in terms of its architectural value, its uh, social value, uh, or its historical value. And the, the difference actually, the, the reason that this comes out of the destruction of Penn Station, or is believed to come directly out of the destruction of Penn Station, is that when Penn Station is demolished, or when the idea of Madison Square Garden is put forward. The issue that the city government had at that time, people often think about it as a situation where there was an opposition to Madison Square Garden. Nobody cared about the old Penn Station. There just wasn't enough, you know, there wasn't enough passion, I think a lot of people think. And that's not the case. There was a great deal of passion against the destruction of Penn Station. And people saw that that was robbing the city of its civic gems. But the issue at that time was that the uh, city government itself had no teeth, had no ability to rule on whether or not a structure could, like, was meritorious in terms of the way that it was using space in terms of land use. So the great architectural critic, Ada Louise Huxtable, explained this in her column in the New York Times at the time of this fight. And she said that even if there were preservationists in city government, even if there were people who believed that the old Penn Station should stand, there was nothing that they could do because the only thing that city government prior to the landmarks law was able to rule on was if a structure was legally appropriate under the what was then the 1961 zoning code. And so because Madison Square Garden was strictly legal under the zoning code, uh, Ada Louise Huxtable makes the beautiful point. She says that if a hot dog stand were strictly legal under the zoning code, then a hot dog stand could have legally replaced the old Penn Station because city government could not rule as to which was more necessary for the city. The, the city government didn't have the teeth to say, 
no, we would rather have the old Penn Station versus this hot dog stand. And so that was the issue that even though you had preservationists and you had people marching in the streets to save what had been this extraordinary civic palace, there was no law that allowed city government to say, no, this palace, this palace for the masses is of greater value than that hot dog stand. And if you want my opinion about Madison Square Garden, I call it a hot dog stand. <laughs> um, sounds, sounds delicious. <laughs> but Brad, but, Brad, you've written, though, that we shouldn't credit Penn Station too much. Um, so what is the bookend to what Lucy's talking about from your perspective? Sure. No, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a very sort of slight distinction, because I do think in the popular mind, Penn Station sort of functioned as this chief catalyst to the passage of the, or really the signature by Mayor Wagner of the landmarks law for the city. But um, there is really, there were a number of different strands already underway. And I think to me, if you really pinpoint what was the straw that broke the camel's back, um, that got the right people to care, that then influenced Wagner, it was the destruction of the Brokaw mansions on the Upper East Side. Um, that, that really did it. But again, we could go into a whole long discourse on that. Um, I did want to say the one thing about um, how New York City got its landmarks law because it, the city would never have had the ability to enact its own landmarks law and have the power to regulate the physical envelope of structures as it does to this day without the enabling legislation at the state level that devolved sufficient police power to the city to do so. And the key act there that did that was the Bard Act in 1956. And now that is a remarkable story as well. Albert Bard, one of the um, civic reformers and preservationists who worked with McEnany on the fight for Castle Clinton and many other things, um, he basically spent almost 50 years of his life, certainly at least 30, 40 years, working to get the state to give the city the power to have a landmarks law. And he tried, he, you know, he tried many, many different times. He tried in the 1930s at a state constitutional convention and that didn't work and he would try again and again. Thankfully, the man lived to be into his 90s and was able to live out this effort and actually make it happen in the 50s. Um, you know, and he was, he was around when there was a very young preservationist in Brooklyn Heights named Otis Pratt Pearsall, who was pushing before there was even a landmarks law for a historic district in Brooklyn Heights. And I am very happy to say that Otis Pratt Pearsall is still around and kicking today um, and has a wonderful archive of all of his engagements over the decades um, in the service of preservation. But he too is a lawyer. Um, who you know was was very much instrumental in these early years of sort of again this this complementary effort in both the political and activist front, but then also in the legal realm to sort of push this whole structure forward. That's right. And if we're teasing some of our listeners right now with all of this preservation history, if you're an attorney um, or just a layperson who's interested in more, um, Brad, how do we find out more about preservation history in New York? Sure, certainly. And we, uh, we're, we're at the New York Preservation Archive Project. Um, go to www.nypap.org, www.nypap.org. And you will find a whole range of different resources from oral histories with preservationists and with city leaders, um, former chairs of the Landmarks Commission, for example. But you'll also find a whole host of entries on things like policy. So if you want to dig up more on the 1916 zoning resolution or the 1961 zoning resolution that Lucy mentioned earlier, uh, you are welcome to knock yourself out. And that is all online there for you waiting. And Lucy, if you want to engage with some of these real buildings in real life, um, how do people go on one of your tours? Sure. So you can find me at archiveonparade.com. That's A-R-C-H-I-V-E-O-N-P-A-R-A-G-E.com. Right. And, and it's just always such a joy to explore um, New York with you, Lucy. Um, you know, we, we talked about McEnany's origins um, in that construction of Penn Station. And then we talked about, you know, almost, you know, a, a perfect example of his legacy in the landmarks law that crystallizes in the aftermath of the destruction of Penn Station. Um, 
and McEnany finds his final resting place so fittingly along the Pennsylvania Railroad um, down in Princeton, New Jersey, um, where he lives out his final days. Um, and he is, in fact, buried today in Princeton as well. Um, so a, a lifelong relationship with, with, uh, with the city and this region um, and, and that, of course, august institution, the Standard Railroad of the world. Um, but, you know, one of the final things that he did um, was take under his wing um, a young girl um, by the name of Kay Siganovic um, today. And Kay has since founded this Friends of George McEnany group. And it's it's a way to sort of examine this man's legacy with the knowledge that he's somewhat forgotten and also with the knowledge that he was sort of a convener um, in, in the best sense, in, in the best legal tradition and the best preservation organizing tradition where it really wasn't about him. And he didn't go out there saying, I'm George McEnany and I approve this message. <laughs> he was saying, I want you to get involved. Um, so as we look back at that sweeping legacy, Lucy, um, what are the lessons that we as preservation-minded New Yorkers, as attorneys, as rabble-rousers and activists, and, and just ordinary people who care, um, what should we take from George McEnany? Sure. Well, I think you said it, the idea that this was not solely about him and that no fight is, has a sort of sole constituency, that there is not just one person, one group of people affected by any policy or any land use goal or any preservation goal, that there are so many of us. Uh, and so bringing ourselves and, you know, our allies together in any given fight or for any given purpose, I think is what really George McEnany shows us how to do, to say, you know, not for oneself alone, that, that we're all looking for a certain outcome or we're all fighting for a certain thing for maybe a number of disparate reasons, but, but that's okay. You know, and if we can all come together and begin to understand what moves and drives any corner of a fight that we can fight so much stronger and so much better together. Brad? Yeah, no, I think if I look at, at McEnany's legacy, I do feel like we have something that amounts to a counterweight to Robert Moses in the grand scheme of things. And it's, it's a pity that there is not a work on the scale of the power broker out there to tell that story. And there's, there's a reason for that. Um, it would, there was, he decidedly did not ever get that bio written. Um, but I think if I look at it, the thing about McEnany is he's involved in all of this civic and political and legal realm but in the end, everything seems to be aiming at humans. It is about livability in the end. Um, and it's maybe a bit of a snaking path to get to where he sort of ultimately finds a, a, a real balance of how that needs to play out in a city. But uh, he seems to care. He seems to actually be envisioning human beings and, and their ability to live in an urban place. Um, to I think a greater extent than Robert Moses. I think Moses in some ways is, is viewing humans sometimes as these sort of units that need to be dealt with. And so there's more of the sort of planning in a void that has theoretical good benefit to humans rather than a sort of looking at humans as the essential starting point um, that I, I find more um, in most of the work that McEnany did. And there's such a lesson in there for all of us um, in the legal field as we do deal with individual cases and controversies and transactions on a day-to-day -day basis. And it, it can sometimes be easy um, to lose sight and mm -hmm. think of it as just a conveyor belt. But if you think back to all the battles that we've discussed here today, um, most of them with illegal valence, some of them not, um, but that theme of, of the stone dropping in New York Harbor and each ripple having its impact on the law on the built environment of the city, um, on the listeners um, here with us today, on the panelists, and groups like the Friends of George McEnany and the Historical Society of the New York Courts, the New York Preservation Archive Project, and, and groups such as Lucy's, the Archive on Parade. Um, we're so grateful for McEnany's legacy, however complicated it may be. 
Um, we're grateful for his impact on the law. And we're grateful for all of you um, joining us on this podcast here. Um, our hope is that this is just a jumping off point. Um, there are lots of resources that we've discussed during the course of this podcast. Please do um, visit the Friends of George McEnany online, um, visit the New York Preservation Archive Project, and sign up for Lucy Levine's uh, mailing list at Archive on Parade so you can come on the next George McEnany tour. But um, Lucy, Brad, really want to thank you for a deep and wide-ranging conversation today. I think we we went deep, but we also went wide, um, and we covered a lot of ground. And I think we've kicked off conversations for future researchers and, and New Yorkers. So Lucy, Brad, thank you. Um, Daniel Sierra of the Historical Society of the New York Courts was integral to the taping of this, um, as were Allison Morey um, and Marilyn Marcus of the Society. I'm surrounded here also in the jury assembly room by a bunch of plants um, that Chief Judge Kay, the late Chief Judge Kay, did donate to our jury assembly room here at 60 Center Street. So we thank um, Judge Kay, as well as all of her successors at the Society and our current leader, uh, Jonathan Lippman, the former Chief Judge of New York. Um, once again, thanking Judge Tingling, uh, John Werner, and Justice Maisley as well um, for, for graciously allowing us to use these spaces. Um, thank you all. Um, let this be the beginning of a discussion of George McEnany's legacy. And uh, light, air, that's the rub. <laughs> Brad, Lucy, thank you. Um, thank you to all the listeners, and we'll see you again soon.